Coming up on Theater Talk. We were doing Little Shop. We were making a profit of six to $8,000 a week. I was thrilled. <laughs> Bernie said, Albert, come here. He showed me the operating statement for the first week of Cats. The profit, $186,000. <laughs> In 1982. Oh my God. I yes, mean, that's 82. No, no show in the history of Broadway that ever made that kind of money. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation and the Honorable Thomas Mercer Ray. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and with me, I have a wonderful, fabulous substitute co-host, Jesse Green <laughs> of New York Magazine. Lead critic and, and only critic, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, no, I have minions. There's are, hundreds of them. Oh, I, no. I just don't let them write. <laughs> right. So Jesse is joining me to talk about this rather interesting new book, about Broadway, which has just been released by Simon & Schuster. Tell me more about this book, It Sue. is <laughs> Razzle Dazzle, The Battle for Broadway by Michael Riedel. Why do I think they're making fun of me? Who is joining <laughs> us this week. Thank you. A big fan of the show. Great to be on. First time guest. <laughs> <laughs> and joining him is one of my favorite people in the theater, producer, general manager, writer, Albert Poland. Performer as well. Performer sometime. as well, Albert. <laughs> Welcome to Theater Talk, and you are a key character in this book. Michael, tell us about it. It's a book about how when the city, New York City, was careening toward bankruptcy in the late 60s and early 70s, and Times Square was very dangerous. It was the Times Square of Midnight Cowboy, really. And Broadway itself was in trouble. They were tearing down the theaters then, making parking lots as they sing in follies. And now this theater will become, in a last blaze of glory, a parking lot. Uh, and the Schubert Organization, which is a key player in my book, was on the verge of bankruptcy. But this book is about the handful of people who stuck by Broadway and the theater. The Schuberts, Jimmy Niederlander, Michael Bennett and Joe Papp with a chorus line, David Merrick coming back with 42nd Street, and eventually Cameron McIntosh and Andrew Lloyd Webber with Cats and Les Mis and Phantom, and how these people rallied to Broadway's cause, saved Broadway, and in so doing helped lift the fortunes, I try to argue in the book, of Times Square and ultimately New York City itself. Well, before, before it got to that point, though, uh, one of the things that I was uh, particularly interested in, you did a, a great deal of historical research and political research, uh, tell us about ICE. And uh, I also want to ask, aside from what is it and how did it work, I, I do wonder, Albert, if you ever saw took it. it. Per- <laughs> if you ever <laughs> took ICE, and now it's sounding like a drug. <laughs> it's a party drug, Albert. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, I don't go to parties with white powder. <laughs> That's what Bernie Jacobs used to say. <laughs> or whether you you know, saw signs of it around you. Anyway, first tell us what well, it I, is. I'm, I'm, yeah, happy you- to, I'm happy to tell you that I never took it. Yeah. Only in my tea. But we don't, we don't know what it is. But, yet. Michael, That's, you uh, begin ice, the book with ice. And ice is our little uh, envelopes of cash slipped to box office treasurers and other people by the ticket brokers. Um, it's their in, bribe to get the for best For favorable seats. location. So, so, but take us through for a second how it actually works. The ticket broker, how, well, where does the money come from and who gets it? Let's go back in time when my book begins with a big ice candle that almost brought down the entire theater industry, including the Schubert organization, right. which really had codified ice back in the early 60s. So if I'm a, if I'm a box office treasurer <clears throat> in 1961, and uh, uh, Plaza Suite has just opened on Broadway at the Plymouth Theater, and it's the biggest hit in town. Everybody wants to see Neil Simon's new hit play, but there are only a limited number of seats per performance. Now, if I'm in the box office, I control all the seats. So what I do is I just take, back then they had racks, remember the hard ticket? I just take all the tickets off the rack, all the prime orchestra locations, and I put them in my pocket. So people come up to the box office, sorry, sold out Saturday night. Now a broker comes to me and says, I need 10 prime orchestra seats for Saturday night. I have them. He pays me the face value of the ticket, let's say is $10, goes into the till, so the ticket's paid for. But in order to get those tickets that I have in my pocket, he pays me an extra bit, let's say 
40 bucks a ticket, 25 bucks a ticket, whatever. A it bit? Is. <laughs> a bit. Well, it was mountains. Well, that was yeah. way back then. And that yeah. is a cash. The IRS never sees it. And nobody knows it exists. And it melts away. And that's why it's called ice. <laughs> but do the theater owners who really are the ones who, if, if anybody should be getting that money, they, they should, or the production should. Well, also people who wrote the show. Who right, right. The so show. Do the producers and the theater owners know that this is when going I begin, on? From your book, it right. seems like they did. When I began my book, the whole business was, um, ice was flowing all over the place. And the Schubert organization, back in the 50s and the 60s, they had a room, 504 of the Sardi building. And that's where the ticket brokers would go put the bribes down on the table and get the tickets and then the money was distributed up and down the chain of the Schubert organization. How and far the only up? two people uh, up to the very top, Lawrence Schubert Lawrence who was running the company then. The only two people uh, that I discovered in researching the book and I interviewed the assistant attorney general who prosecuted this case, the only two people who had something to say against it and who cooperated with his investigation very quietly were Bernie Jacobs and Jerry Schoenfeld, who were the Schubert lawyers. And as lawyers, they were appalled about what was going on. And Jerry told me, and he says in his book, that they warned um, uh, John Schubert, the son who was in charge of the empire then, that this could send them all to jail, but didn't want to hear. Later, after they took over, Bernie took me and showed me the first box office computer, which he said was going to stop the flow of ice. And so I said, so now the computer will retire and move to Florida? <laughs> Now, ICE wasn't the only kind of dirty goings on, you know, in the period immediately prior to the period you cover. And I think it's important in, in understanding what the Schuberts and the other uh, people that you discussed did to to understand that it was a, it was kind of a, uh, a shoot 'em up Western town at Broadway at the time. You, I think you called it Wild West with tap shoes or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nobody was really watching anything. You know, uh, people would. Yeah, you know, guys like some of the fly-by-night producers of the day, they'd say, oh, uh, Albert, I'm doing a new play, and uh, you can come in for $10,000. Well, there was no record of where your money went. So maybe 5000 of it went into the play, and another 5000 went, you know, in, in one case, as I cite in the book, to buy my uh, oyster boat in Montauk. There was absolutely no accounting at all. It was kind of a... A bit of a backwater, slightly seedy business uh, back in the in, in the 50s and 60s. I mean, even even the stars of uh, plays like Rudy Valley, when he was in How to Succeed in Business, would openly walk up and down the street saying, you know, here are my house seats for How to Succeed in Business and sell them to Hickey's, the ticket broker, or Mackey's, or whatever, whatever they were called back in those days. There was also, for me, I, I think it's interesting and important to note the some questions about the way the Schubert organization itself was run. It has a highly unusual structure and was uh, looked into by district attorneys for that at some point. Tell us about that. It was a family business. It was created by uh, Lee J.J. and uh, Sam Schubert. Uh, They were Eastern European immigrants, no education. I mean, I don't really think they could really even read, actually. And uh, Sam Schubert, they, they came through New York, Queens, and then they went to Syracuse. And Sam Schubert was selling newspapers one day when he was 15 or 16 years old outside of, um, I think it was the White Lean Theater up in Syracuse. And the guy who ran the theater took pity on this little kid who was out in the cold selling his newspapers and invited him in to see the matinee. And within a week, Sam Schubert was in the box office working there. And within about a couple of months, he was running the box office. And within a year, he was running the theater. And within two years, he was buying his own theaters. He and his brothers were beginning to form their own theater chain in upstate New York. And Sam realized that you know, you, he would come to New York quite a bit to look at the plays here to book them for the theater chain. And he realized that the name of the game was to be in New York City. And at that time, New York City was controlled by the syndicate, which was this very powerful monopoly of five or six Broadway producers who ran everything. They dictated all the terms. All the actors worked for them. All the directors worked for them. They told you what you were going to get paid, what theater you were going to play in New York and around the country. Yeah. They were not theater owners. They were... They were theater owners. Erlanger uh-huh. owned the new... He built the new Amsterdam Theater. Okay. They, but you have to remember back then, all the theaters were individually owned by impresarios. So Oscar Hammerstein I had his own theater, and Belasco had his own theater, and the syndicate had their own theaters. There was not this sort of idea of a Schubert organization or the Nederlanders. And indeed, everybody lived above the store. All of the great old Broadway theaters had these wonderful apartments above them because these guys, they were basically Lower East Side guys who would do. If you had a, a butcher shop down the Lower East Side, you lived above it. Here they have no theaters. They lived above it. So Sam Schubert comes to New York and he uh, leases a, not a great theater, but uh, he has some success with it. And slowly he begins to assemble his chain. 
and that leads to a battle with the syndicate, and they decide they're going to destroy these little kids from Syracuse. Uh, but in the end, the Schubert's wound up destroying the syndicate, and they emerge as the most powerful theater company in the world. Uh, and as I say, it's a family business, but Sam dies very young in a tragic train accident, and his, um, his brothers Lee and uh, um, J.J. run it. And what happens is that J.J. is going to leave everything to his only heir, the only real direct heir to the Schubert empire, John Schubert. But John Schubert dies, has a massive heart attack on a train visiting his mistress, and J.J. is now in dementia. So there's nobody really to run this company. And the way J.J. has set things up, and it was a total tax dodge, he leaves the theaters, which are the income generators, to a foundation, which is a nonprofit foundation. Now, again, this is a time when the IRS is not policing these things. And this is just a very good way, somebody I quote in the book says, to park a lot of money that nobody will ever see. But that setup exists to this day. The foundation is in the will of J.J. Schubert. It is a completely legal entity now. Uh, and the Schubert organization, as Albert knows, cannot be owned by anybody. Right. It is owned by the foundation. The Schubert organization pays taxes on their profits. And the foundation is a nonprofit company that gives away millions and millions of dollars in grants to education and theater and whatnot. But Bernie Jacobs and Jerry Schoenfeld, who ran it for a long, long time, J.J.'s lawyers, always refer to themselves as employees. Yes. They could never have equity in this multi-billion dollar business. And nobody ever can. It is a solely owned Pe by the People, you know, were very well aware of their power. And um, whenever Bernie would speak at a memorial service or something like that, he would come out on the stage and say, I'm Bernie Jacobs. I work for the Schubert Organization. <laughs> <laughs> so, Albert, how did you come to know... Bernie Jacobs, and Jerry Schoenfeld? Well, when I was 24, uh, David Cryer and I produced a touring company of the Fantastics. Yes. Uh, and we played 100 cities all over the United States. It was a very exciting time. And, um, and you know, we had the naive and the bravado of people who didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> and uh, all of the musicians' unions in the major cities had, had uh, you know, requirements of how many musicians had to be employed. And I appeared before each board and got them to wave, with the exception of Philadelphia. Philadelphia had 20, and they <laughs> demanded we employ 20. For the Fantastics, right? Yes, <laughs> it, which was scored for four. Right. So uh, the, uh, the theater manager said, call Gerald Schoenfeld in New York. He's the attorney for Schubert, and he negotiated the contract. I called him, and, and he got on the phone uh, with Alvin Cooperman, and I felt like I was being patted on the head. <laughs> we'll take you to lunch tomorrow and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I said, I'm not interested in lunch. I need some help. Um, so the next day he called and he said, you know, you, ha you have 20 musicians ready and willing and uh, able to play. You have nothing for them to play. <laughs> and I said, I'll fix that. <laughs> and I got an orchestration of the Star Spangled Banner for 20 pieces, <laughs> took it to Philadelphia and announced to the Philly papers that they would be draped across the front of the stage and rise <laughs> before the curtain and play the national anthem, and I would then lock them into their dressing room. <laughs> got a ton of publicity. The Wall Street Journal loved you for the it. The Wall Street Journal ran an editorial. <laughs> we got front page and all the papers, sold out the engagement, and six weeks later, the guy, head of the union, was voted out, and they cut it back to six, and Jerry and Bernie became my lawyers. <laughs> And also, you became really one of their oldest friends in the business, I think. Yes, we, 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 had a, we developed a lifelong friendship, uh, two great friendships. And uh, in 1982, I brought them Little Shop of Horrors, and they produced their first off-Broadway show. But Bernie and Jerry are big characters in the book because I, they really saved the Schubert empire. Uh, they pushed out the drunken nephew who was really running it into the ground. I mean, he, he, he literally ran it from the second floor bar at Sardi's. He was, as Bernie Jacobs once said in, in an interview that I have that he did for his family before he died, he said, Lawrence Schubert Lawrence had alcohol in his system 24 hours a day. <laughs> well, I, I'd just like to say something about Michael's book and about Jerry and Bernie. Um, for me, they've become larger with time, and Michael's book is very much in that direction. Uh, and it just makes a very clear-cut case by, uh, for not only how they saved the Schubert organization, which was floundering, but Broadway and New York City. It's a very clear-cut, well-documented case. And, 
And if that sounds dry, uh, reading it is, <laughs> is like jumping back into everything that was going on because you have the passion and the wit and Michael's particular deliciousness. Um, well, well I was, see, I, I, I didn't know Bernie very much because he was kind of out of it when I came on, but I got to know Jerry very, very well. Jerry was a wonderfully colorful character. And the rap against them, when they got very powerful and they ran the Schubert empire, everyone said, oh, they're just lawyers, they're just lawyers. But I never saw Jerry as a lawyer. They were as theatrical characters as David Merrick or Arthur Cantor or any of these guys. They were characters. They had real character. Um, they were not uh, paint by numbers or checkbook producers, as I call the, some of the present day people. <laughs> Um, <laughs> they actively turned around Times Square. I mean, it was a wasteland. It was, you know, uh, and, and Jerry was very involved in all of that and very involved in Manhattan Plaza. You know, and working with them, I did 10 shows with them. Working with them, every moment was vital. Um, but there was always fun in the room, you know, and I love fun, as does Michael, so. Didn't you used to wear a cape back in those days? I did, yes. He would wear a cape when he came to the Schubert offices, and <laughs> Jerry said... <laughs> David Belasco has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had great affection for Jerry. Um, and I wanted to show, because a lot of this book came from my conversations with Jerry over the years. I used to go up to his office, and he loved to play Mr. Producer, you know. So, Michael, would you like to see how the magic happens? <laughs> sure. So I said, that's how, you know, that's how we talked. Well, I took a show to him <laughs> once, and so we had the producer sitting with him, with, with me, and uh, he stood up at the end and said, the waters will not part for this production. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the Pope isn't here in New York yet. So. But, but, but Jerry, Jerry would tell me the whole history of the organization. I'd sit watch him and he'd take phone calls and he'd put speaker, people on speakerphone and he'd be trying to negotiate a deal with Sam Cohn. But by this point, they were both kind of out of it, so they forgot what they were talking about. It was like watching the, the Sunshine Boys produce a play. I, but Jerry would give me tours of their offices, which were Lee Schubert's executive, uh, well, his, par his apartment. I mean, Jerry was in Lee's bedroom. That's what his office was. Right. And Bernie's office was Lee's living room. And Jerry had, at the back of his office, he had Lee's actual bathroom, completely untouched from the time Lee Schubert lived there. And it was this Italian pink tiling, and it had this massive shower that had um, nozzles all over, like you would now find in a, in a fancy, fancy um, uh, hotel where you get the sort of the, the power shower. I used to call it the Schubert power shower because you have six <laughs> nozzles. Back. And the other thing, his, Lee Schubert's barber chair was right. up there in the yes, back. Yes, yes, yes. And, and Lee Schubert you know, would get yes. up there and have a shave at 4 o'clock every day, and then some chorus girl or other would come up and perform other services for him. <laughs> and in the back of Jerry's fabulous, great, wonderfully designed office is this time capsule of what this place was like in, in 1920, 1930, 1940 with the barber chair. And I remember he had stacked on the barber chair, he had stacks of these old legal files, all yes. yellowing. And I used to go through them and they would be signed by Schubert <clears throat> attorneys, Bernie Jacobs and Jerry Schoenfeld, all just kind of tossed in the back. Jerry had, uh, I would think, more of a veneer uh, than Bernie did. Bernie was himself at all times. I, I walked into his office at 10 o'clock one morning and he was sitting there with a red spot on his cheek with three plies of toilet paper stuck to his cheek, <laughs> yelling into the phone, Mr. De Rothschild, I can't hear you. Mr. De Rothschild, I'm in the business of selling tickets. Now I cannot give you free tickets. I can't hear you. I hung up and I said, so the Baron de Rothschild wanted a pair of comps for cats? Comps? He wanted an entire house. He's giving a benefit. He thinks I should give the tickets. What is he anyway? Just a man with a duh in front of his name. <laughs> they were characters and they recognized because they had worked for J.J. and they had fought his battles, the big battle being the antitrust suit that the government right. brought against the Schubert organization to break it up. And Bernie and Jerry were, especially Jerry, was instrumental in helping to save the Schubert organization when it was under assault from antitrust charges. They'd spent their, their adult lives at Schubert. And in the <clears throat> 60s and into the early 70s, they saw this company really being run into the ground by the drunken nephew. Because as I said, John Schubert died before J.J. did. So it just went to the kind of last standing Schubert, who is this drunk. And at some point... Uh, they, they realized that to save themselves, let alone the business, they had to get rid of this guy. And they staged a boardroom coup, and they pushed Lawrence Schubert Lawrence out, and they took over the, the theater company for themselves, and then they set about pulling it together. What happened to him after he was pushed out? 
Well, there were lawsuits, and as I detail in the book, he went after them. But in the end, he was dismissed by the court, and he faded away. He, I think he wound up in Boca Raton, Florida, where he kept on his coffee table in his condo a book that said, The Trouble with Lawyers. <laughs> but, but it wasn't just the family problems. What, what, how bad did it get? Once they got control over the organization, they began, pretty quickly had to begin dealing with what was happening in Times Square and in New York in yeah. general. Uh, how bad was it? Well, and how, how badly did it affect their, <clears throat> their income? Right. Well, they, when they took over the company, they had a cash flow problem. And uh, Bernie Jacobs went to J.P. Morgan, who had been the Schubert, J.P. Morgan himself had been the Schubert Brothers Bank. And Bernie needed a million dollar line of credit. And he used his collateral, the 17 Schubert theaters. And J.P. Morgan turned him down in 1972 because they determined, the bank determined, that 17 Broadway theaters were not worth a million dollars in Times Square in 1972. Now, just to give you a perspective of that, today the Schuberts are going to build a new theater in Times Square. The minimum cost is between 150 and $200 million for one theater. And that doesn't include the land because the Schuberts already own that land. But that's, that gives you a sense of how um, imperiled the business was back then. And you have to remember, too, a lot is happening in the city. You have white flight going on. And let's face it, Broadway has always been the, uh, the audience has always been pretty white. They're leaving the city. You have the garment industry, which was a very important um, uh, feeder of audiences to Broadway because it was right there on Broadway's doorstep. And all the garment executives were giving tickets to all their buyers and all that, could take them to the hot shows. The garment industry is falling apart because industry in New York is falling apart. The taxes are too high. The city's becoming overcrowded. They can't move goods and services around. The city itself cannot pay its pension funds. The city itself cannot pay its bills. The city is going bankrupt. You start to have strikes. You have policemen strikes. You have garbage strikes. And the whole city is becoming the city, really, as I say, of, um, of, of midnight cowboy. I mean, so when the Schuberts set about to... Oh, and let me just put m- one more point. The attendance from Broadway, which had had an all-time high of 10 million in the sort of early to mid-60s, when there's still a lot of shows. By the time Bernie and Jerry got control of the company in 72, attendance on Broadway had gone from 10 million to 4.5 million. I mean, half its audience was gone in a matter of seven, eight years. Was it a was it deliberate on their part that they set out, let's make a plan to reverse this, which meant dealing with the city and in the end forming partnerships, public-private partnerships in order to Very do much that? so. Very much so. And they, and they opened up funding for productions. They welcomed producers into their offices to discuss new productions. They, they spread it around and they really uh, brought a new vitality to something that had been, you know, moribund. Who was the mayor that they were most... Uh, well, they were close to A. Beam. A. Beam. Yes, A. Lindsay was there at the beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, it, he didn't know how to turn any of the wheels. That's when all the strikes were happening. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Michael, yeah. Lindsay was glamorous, but he couldn't run the city. What, what do you think was the uh, moment at which the situation turned, or you, it began to be possible to see that their plan, which was also the plan of many other people, was going to work. What, what changed? I think what happened was they had to save the company first. And they saved the company because Bernie and Betty, his wife, and Manny Eisenberg and uh, Alex Cohn, they went down to see Michael Bennett's new show about anonymous kids who dance in the chorus at the public theater. And it was a chorus line. And they decided that they would take that show for the Schubert Theater on Broadway. And I remember Phil Smith, who's now the chairman of the board, and it was Bernie Jacobs' right-hand man for many years. Phil Smith thought, you know, we were thrilled we had a winner in a chorus line. And we thought if it ran four or five years, we'd be all right. Well, it ran 15 years and was produced all over the world. And as Phil Smith said to me at a dinner one night, he said, you know, Michael, before a chorus line, there was no money. After a chorus line, there was nothing but money. But the point is that you had to have the shows the shows that they put in their theaters, the shows that they helped produce, the shows that they helped finance. Because remember, the Schubert organization was doing nothing before they took over. The Schubert organization was not producing. Nothing, nothing was going on there. Bernie and Jerry were actively looking for people like Michael Bennett, I th- like I, Albert Poland, who were I, bringing them shows. I think the next uh, bump happened with Cats, yep. which Schubert co-produced with Cameron McIntosh. I think Cats took the theater out of the theater and put it into world pop culture. You know, which was just huge, and it replaced the vanishing theater audience who could no longer afford the theater. 
you know, made it available to the world. Uh, and it also turned Broadway into a family business. Cats became the first gigantic family show. Ironically, you know, Cameron and Andrew never thought of it as a family show. That's what they told. They never, they never thought of it. That's not how they thought about doing shows. You know, it's a crazy idea. You're going to uh, uh, take these nonsense poems of T.S. Eliot about cats and make a musical out of it. They couldn't raise the money for it. Andrew had to mortgage his his house, Sidmonton, that he bought with the money from Jesus when, Christ Superstar, to, to get the show on. When we were doing Little Shop, we were making a profit of six to eight thousand dollars a week. I was. Th- <laughs> Bernie said, Albert, come here. He showed me the operating statement for the first week of Cats. The profit, $186,000. <laughs> in 1982. Oh my God. I yes, mean, that's 82. No, no show in the history of Broadway that ever made that kind of money. I think we've dealt with like the first 30% of the book now, Michael. Does this so, mean we're ready for the larger room? So, yes, I think so. <laughs> so, Michael and Albert, we're going to have to extend this interview. We'll be back with the second part soon. And I want to thank you, Michael Riedel. Good job in your, in, as you start your writing career, <laughs> your, not, your, your historian career. Although you, you were a historian at Columbia University. Yes, I mean, it's a historical book, but it doesn't read like a history book. No, No, it doesn't. It's not an academic book. Albert Poland, (laughs) come on back, and we'll have the extended interview online, of course. Good night, Jesse. You are wonderful. Thanks, Susan. All right. I mean, thanks, Susan. Where the hell is it? (laughs) Thanks, Susan. (laughs) Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.